this hour. So before we begin, I'm going to just do some taking care of business things. Hang tight just a second. My slide isn't going. Oh, there we go. Okay, so just some taking care of business before we get started. Um, this is um, going to be recorded and published. So by, by participating, you're agreeing to be part of this recording. Um, it will be accessible on the Reading Rev YouTube channel and also on the U um, Reading Rev Facebook members page later this week. So if you want access to both of those, it is a QR code at the end of the presentation. Um, we had over 500 people register, so everyone is going to be muted and cameras are off. I was hoping to make it a little bit more interactive tonight, but just because of the numbers, we're going to keep everybody muted and cameras off. But there will be a question and answer section at the end. So for each section, go ahead and and put your questions in the chat. And I have two co-hosts, Kelly and Joe are here tonight, and they are going to be collecting questions and kind of organizing them into themes to help them with that. If you would please, when you add a question to the chat, would you um, start it with a question mark? Normally we end with a question. I want you to start it with a question mark so they can really be clear sorting out your questions from just your comments. Okay, let's get started. The big idea today is we're going to talk about what structured literacy looks like in the intermediate grades. Um, we've been talking a ton about the science of reading. It's really caught on. And most of the conversations that I, that I hear about are relating to primary and emergent reading. And so um, I wanted to give a chance tonight that we really look at the science of reading through an intermediate lens through third through fifth grade. So our big key questions, the targets of tonight's presentation are, how do I teach all the things? How do I teach advanced phonics and spelling and morphology and syntax? And then also make sure I'm teaching real content. How do I meet the needs of my diverse learners? Because we know that the gap can really grow. And in intermediate grades, we have kids and very different skills and knowledge. And then how do I respectfully remediate big kids? So just before we Get started. I'm going to give you just a quick snapshot of my journey. I'm a mom of three kids, and I think one of the biggest um, impacts on my professional career has been that my three children had completely different experiences going through school. My oldest son, Ty, um, was smart, and school should not have come hard, difficult to him. He was um, great for the first few years. And then I felt like as intermediate grades started coming, he started struggling with motivation and attention to detail and just kind of battled that. I felt like we always kind of were lighting a motivational fire under him. And then my daughter Mackenzie came along and she was just dying to be in, in kindergarten, the most bubbly, vivacious, happy five-year-old you'd ever, ever meet. And it didn't take us very long at all to realize that she was going to struggle with literacy. And the rest of her career um, was just was a long road. She battled a lot of um, struggles. We had parent conferences and homework battles and, and just the whole thing. And by high school, um, she had lots of anxiety around school. And then the baby came along five years later, and he was really just um, kind of the typical who school is designed for, right? It came very easy to him. He was organized and had all the executive functioning and enjoyed it and just kind of breezed through. And I, it made me realize being a mom of such different kids, how I needed to really see all of the kids in my classroom. So edu um, educationally, I taught fifth grade for 12 years. I loved it. This is my niche. This is the age group that I really love. But after 12 years, I was like, I think I'm ready for a change. And so I switched schools and went down to second grade. And it was very obvious really early on that second grade is a completely different ballgame. And I, within the first month, had kids coming to my reading table. And I realized I'm, I'm in trouble because I have a handful of kids that are not really readers. And I don't know what to do. So I went back to school and got my master's degree in literacy and just did a deep dive. That's where I discovered that my sweet daughter was dyslexic. 
and she was a senior at the time. So, so much heartache and disservice had been done by that point. And I made a um, pact and promise to myself that I was going to help other kids and families so that their story didn't mimic ours. And I started a company called Reading Rev. It began in 2018 as a tutoring business. And I was tutoring kids on evenings and weekends and during the summer and just burned out, realized I can't save all of the children um, that are struggling in school one kid at a time. So I branched out into professional development and um, curriculum. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So I wanted to start with a poll and just get a really quick dipstick of who's in the room with us. Um, based on these literacy terms and just kind of the overarching science of reading umbrella, what would you say your background knowledge is? So one is I'm just starting out on this journey. I'm excited, but I don't know very much. And five is I think I'm an expert. So we're going to start a poll and you're just going to quickly answer two questions. And then the second question is, what grade or position are you in? So are you a teacher? Are you an admin? Just so we can do a quick. All right. I love that we have a couple K2 teachers in here as well. And if you're the other, put in the chat what your what your position or title is so I can capture that next time. All right. So it looks like a lot of people in here are threes and fours, which is amazing. It can kind of show us how far we've come in this in this journey. Nice. Okay. Here are the final results. Okay, moving right along. For some reason, I feel like my screen is not. Maybe Joe, can you tell me why I'm my tech person, why my next slide will not move? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I know the country is waking up to the fact that reading instruction has not gone very well. I can tell a huge difference just in the last five or six years that I've been in this, that we are gaining momentum. Teachers are um, are getting trained. We're talking about it. We're talking about it in the media now, even. And I have such great hope for our future. I think that college prep um, programs are going to start training teachers in, in the science of reading and how to teach reading. I think that kids entering kindergarten are going to have knowledgeable reading teachers. They're going to have um, great instruction from the get-go. But my, my worry is the middle kids, right? The kids that are sitting in classrooms today and the teachers in classrooms today that are overwhelmed and we did not receive the training in college and we don't really know what to do. And so I wanna make sure that we don't leave those kids behind. I'm gonna do one minute or less per slide for those of you that were ones and twos and, and I wanna make sure we don't leave you behind. So the five components of reading plus oral language, so we now call it the five plus, are these five components. And back in 2000, Congress was actually charged with a committee of people that looked at all the research in, about reading and, and the science of reading and decided what needs to be taught and how. And so this is not new. That was 23 years ago. And yet somehow it, it hasn't quite gone. Um, I was in a first class in second grade that I took was called multi-sensory reading instruction. And they charged us with the opening activity was write down the five components of reading and why each is important. And I was looking around like, hmm, I, I'm, I'm a little over my head here. And a lot of other teachers were kind of making eye contact with me like, we're not sure. And I think that we often think about the five components of literacy when we're thinking about primary kids. We, we don't, I didn't even know what phonological awareness was when I started teaching. But I want to tonight shed light 
that these five components actually are very, very important to intermediate grades as well. So phonological awareness is hearing and manipulating the sounds in a language. And in kindergarten, that might be like hearing the sounds in cat, k, at, and identifying the first one. But in intermediate grades, phonological awareness is equally important because I need to be able to know how many syllables a word has and then hear the sounds in each syllable in order to spell it. So if I want to spell evident, I need to make sure that I can hear evident and I can hear all of those sounds. Phonics is matching those sounds to a code or a symbol or a letter. And so in primary, that would say we're going to match the sound to th, but in intermediate, that would be we're matching the sounds in evident, and there are a lot more of them, but I still have to be able to identify them. And the same is true in fluency. We often think of fluency at a very primary letter level, but fluency needs to be practiced at an advanced level too, because as sen sentence structure and syntax increase, then we also need to practice and read fluently that higher content. And I know that when I first started teaching, I read out of Tom Sawyer, Sawyer to my class and I read it out loud and I was like, what is happening? I can read silently, but oral reading is a completely different skill that would, would need to be practiced, right? The next one is Scarborough's Reading Rope. I'm sure you've seen this blasted everywhere. It's, it's all over right now, but it's a really amazing visual of, um, of how we can think of how complex reading is. So it really goes to word recognition, right? Being able to decode and lift the words off a page and then language comprehension. Even if I can read those words, what meaning do I make of them? And it is complete incredibly a complex thing that has all of those components have to go in order for a student to be a skilled reader. And we're going to use this in a later example of intermediate, intermediate literacy. The um, International Dyslexia Association came up with a, the term coined the term structured literacy several years ago, and it's really what to teach and how to teach it. So these are, if you can think about these, are really the bottom half of that that literacy rope. And so we need to teach phonology or the sounds. We need to teach phonics and syllabication and morphology and syntax, how we put words together in a sentence and semantics, how we make that all make sense. So that's kind of the bottom half of the reading rope. But we also need to teach that systematically and cumulatively and explicitly. And we need to be able to diagnose when it's not going well. Okay, take a deep breath. We're almost done. We then have the top half of Scarborough's reading rope, which is all about knowledge. So we can't just teach kids to decode because reading isn't about just decoding. Reading is about gaining meaning from what we read. And so I read The Knowledge Gap um, a decade ago and just recently reread it. And the two quotes that I came around about out of it that are just so simple but capture the entire idea is, knowing stuff makes you a better reader. So the more you know, the more you comprehend when you read, the more background knowledge you have. And my second one is knowledge is sticky. So it's like we're building schema and the schema in our brain is Velcro. And if you have the rough side of the Velcro up, every new idea or new thing you learn can Velcro to something you already know. And you're building this knowledge at a much, much faster rate than if it's just landing basic facts randomly. There is, I'm from Colorado and I'm very proud of this study. There's a brand new study that was just released this month and it's been kind of nicknamed the Colorado study. And it involved over 2000 students that it found that students that had content rich knowledge building curriculum that lasted four years starting in kindergarten. So from kindergarten to third outperformed peers on standardized reading comprehension tasks by a lot. And one of the big, huge ideas that came out of this study is even kids from the low income families performed the same as kids from higher income families. And we often say that income matter, income levels matter because those kids have more experience. They possibly have more, um, I, more books in their house or more um, parents are more educated. It's just been, it's just been shown. And this could close that gap. So 
The simple view of reading is our last one. And then we're going to jump into to the big kids. Um, if you can't decode, but you have a lot of language comprehension, you can't read. Reading comprehension will fail. And opposite than that is if you can decode all the words fluently and accurately, but you can't attach meaning, reading comprehension fails. And so we need to be able to really look at kids struggling with reading and identify where they are in this simple view of reading. So let's start with how do you teach all the things. As I go through this, feel free to pop questions in the chat and we will collect those for the end. How do you teach all the things? How do you teach all of the foundational skills, what to teach, how to teach it? How do you make sure that you're gaining enough knowledge? How do you make sure that you're getting all of those sub skills? And how do you also make sure that you're teaching grammar and biology and chemistry and reading and literature and all of the things? So for each one of these questions, I narrowed it down to three key components. For this one, it is be systematic, start with content, and integrate, integrate, integrate. So we want to be systematic by identifying the skills that we know that our students need to have and then teaching those skills in a sequence from simple to complex. And by doing this, we avoid the plugging the holes model. And I think when I first started in reading intervention, I was doing this. I was reading with kids and noticing that they, oh my goodness, these kids are not pronouncing the T-I-O-N or the I-O-N suffix, and they're definitely not spelling it. So I need to make sure I teach that. And then I would teach that and notice like, oh, they're not reading hard and soft C and G correctly. And so I would teach that. And what I missed is once you're starting to plug those holes and it no longer is systematic and you can't tell where you've been and where you're headed. You also want to be really systematic with your routines. Routines are important because it allows students to use all their mental effort to learn new content rather than the new game or the new activity. If we did a new thing every time, then we would, the kids would constantly be learning the new activity or the new routine, right? But if we do the same thing every day, then what they're learning is the content. So we made um, Google Slides. These are available for free if you um, do the QR code. We made Google Slides with our scope and sequence of um, what we think older kids need in order to um, be proficient in phonics and spelling. And we, our Google Slides are very predictable. Every Monday, we introduce the new pattern in the same way. Every Tuesday, we introduce the red words or the irregular words. And on Thursday, they do a deep dive with morphology. And it becomes so predictable that A, it's easy for me to plan, right? I'm not planning new lessons from scratch every week. And then also the kids know, oh yeah, I know what to do when the slide does this when, we, when we're doing this activity. And I use this predictable routine for all five components. I use that for my games and our, our activities. I say, take out your whiteboards. We're doing three, two, one reveal. And I don't have to teach the kids the new activity. They just know what I'm doing, right? We have a morphology routine. We have a vocabulary routine. We have a comprehension routine. And I recently watched a webinar with, um, it's called Beyond Retelling, Navigating Complex Texts. And it was um, amazing, amazing um, in that they created a routine for how to analyze really complicated text and how kids get to get kids to build and glean comp and comprehension and really make higher level claims from that. And one of the routines that they used was a syntax routine where they would have a sentence and it was not a basic sentence, like a complex co compound sentence, really rich information. And they would break that down into literal understanding and then deconstructing the sentence. And it was um, very, very cool. And that um, webinar was from Mitchell Brookins and I have it um, linked for you at the end. The second one is start with content. I did a deep dive into language comprehension the last few months and wrote a blog. This QR code, if you wanna quickly snap it, is the background knowledge blog. So I obviously don't have a ton of time tonight to go into it deeply, but if you want to go back and read about more, you can find that there. So when I first started teaching, um, it was really, really popular to order these books that were like main idea and summarizing, 
an inference book, a prediction book. And we taught the skill, right? We taught this week, we're teaching prediction. And there would be some passages and some random content, but our focus was to make sure that the kids knew how to predict. We want to do actually exactly the opposite. I want to teach kids the content and show them that really good readers question and predict and kind of infer naturally. And the comprehension skills is not my focus. The Underground Railroad is my focus. I want to teach kids real things. And I am not doing away with comprehension skills. I'm still showing them how to, how I'm inferring. I'm still showing them how great readers question con- naturally all the time. But my content is driving it. So I did a little experiment with this this year. And in third grade, we, um, we use dibbles for our diagnostic and progress monitoring. And in third grade, there is a passage about a nature preserve. And every single year, our progress monitoring graphs are going up. They're going up. They're going up. And we're like, oh, everything's great. And then we get to this passage and it just tanks. And for years, I was like, what happened? And then I was like, oh, it's fine. It's just that nature preserve passage. No big deal, right? And so last summer in one of our classes, I said I would be so fascinated to do a little experiment and see if I just gave them a little background knowledge about nature preserves, because I don't think kids use that language. Even if they've been to one, they might not know that that's what it's called. And maybe some of my kids have never been. So I, one of the teachers was like, why don't you do that? That would be fascinating. So I wrote a sticky note in my progress monitoring binder and said, do, do an experiment. And this year, I went ahead and tested six of my third grade intervention students and just went ahead and did the cold read and let them tank. And they did. And then later that afternoon, I pulled them into my room and I gave a nine minute little mini lesson about nature preserves. And I first showed them how to decode the word nature because it's weird, right? You would not think that that was, it's not phonetically sound. So I said, actually, T-U-R-E is a suffix that shows the word is a noun. And we have a lot of words in our language that we use all the time, like picture and mixture and lecture and adventure. And so once you kind of see that that's a suffix that we know how to pronounce, then you can read these words, no problem. And then we looked at preserve and I'm like, oh my goodness, it has the prefix pre, and we've already learned that. We know it means before. So to preserve something means to maintain or save it before it changes or goes bad. And so then we talked about what nature is. We talked about things that we would want to preserve. We had a group discussion about what would we find at a nature preserve? What would we not find at a nature preserve? Um, if you were going to spend the day there, what what might you do? What might you need to bring? Why would it be important for people to set aside or preserve pieces of nature? What would be the impact of that? And so this was the experiment. I then the next day tested those exact same kids. And you can see that the blue line of my graph is the first day read and the gray line is the second day read. And this is not like they didn't read it right away. So it's not even the same day. It wasn't a rehearsed passage. And then I also didn't want to do wait too long because I didn't want too much instruction to go by. So within one day with a nine minute background lesson about nature preserves, all of my kids grew significantly in accuracy and fluency and most of them grew in their retail. And Dibble's retail, if you don't know, it's it's just a quality of response one to four. So it's it's a little ambiguous, but some of them, one, one student went from a quality of response of a one to a four. Background knowledge is important. The last key component is integrate. So there's something called frequency bias. And this is when you recently learn something and then you see it everywhere. So this happens a lot when you buy a new car and then suddenly you're like, oh, that model of car is everywhere. It's all over the road. And I never even noticed it before. Right. So we want to start our teaching and we want to teach building that frequency model. We don't want or that frequency bias. We don't want kids to think phonics just happens between 820 and 840 every day. I want them to see phonics throughout the day. I want them to notice these patterns and start reading and being like, oh my goodness, there's that pattern again. 
And I also am going to, when I'm teaching my phonics lesson, choose words that are from my content. And so kids start seeing that, that literacy is integrated. Literacy is all the time, not in chunks of subjects throughout my day. I also am going to just integrate as much as I can in my daily lesson. So in history, later on in the afternoon, I am going to spell words on the board using my phonetic patterns, right? I'm going to say cow word. It's two syllables, cow, tap out the sounds in cow. And I'm going to quickly just point those out because that is reinforcing that you should be thinking about phonics all the time too, not just when we're doing phonics. I do this with novels. I do this in core subjects like history and science. We have a page that's called a pattern hunt that we fill out throughout the entire week of how many times can you see this pattern. I integrate grammar and writing, not just as an isolated thing, but we learn grammar through content. So in the escape by night, we'd learned um, a positive phrases in our syntax or grammar lesson. And then we dissected a couple sentences in our novel that look, oh my goodness, the author of this novel must know about a positive phrases. Can you imagine? And I'm getting them to see it and have as much exposure in authentic ways as I possibly can. We are doing a new literacy adoption at my school district. And one of the charges um, or the, the objectives is that every student receives two hours of literacy instruction every day. And when we were sitting in the big auditorium and I heard that, I was like, oh, yeah, easy. I can I can do that easy. I could teach literacy all day. If you added up the minutes in my day that I teach literacy, it would be a lot. It would be all day. So two hours, nothing. Okay, go ahead and ask your questions. If you have questions about building background knowledge or integrating or um, any of the, or I'm like spacing out what my third point is. If you have any questions about those key components or how you teach literacy, add them to our chat now. And we're gonna move on to how to meet the needs of all learners. Okay. We know that sitting kids sitting in our classroom can have huge, huge discrepancies in skills and knowledge, right? So in a third grade classroom, I can think of a kid that right now this year is very much an emergent reader and he is working on foundational skills of reading. And I can also think of a kid in that same third grade class that I could put anything in front of that kid and they could read it and comprehend it. And so how does the teacher meet the needs of such incredibly varied um, skills? The three key components of this one are teacher knowledge, learning for all classrooms, and the 80-20 rule. So in order to comprehend a text, the reader must decode and recognize the meaning of 90% or more of the words. And if they don't, then we need to, as teachers, be knowledgeable enough to know how to get them there. And when I was a fifth grade teacher, I did not. If a student was struggling, I didn't really know what to do. So really, in order to be a great, efficient, effective reading teacher, teachers need to know how reading works in the brain. They need to know all of the subskills that go into accurate, fluent reading that's comprehensible. They need to go, they need to know how speaking is natural and language starts with sound. They also need to know how reading and writing is not how the brain was wired. That's not natural. And so any kind of written language, neural, new neural pathways need to be formed. And it's complex. So from the basic sound letter correspondence, B says B, to complex compound sentences, to advanced sentence structure and essays, that needs to be explicitly taught because that's not what humans were naturally born to do. We need to know how to teach that in a systematic, cumulative way. Teachers also need to know the code of English themselves. And I was raised in 
definitely a whole language era. And I didn't know the phonic patterns. So when I got to second grade, I, I didn't know. And I was looking things up like, oh, son of a gun that, yeah, I guess, I guess that is how it works. So teachers need to be able to crack the code themselves so that they can help students crack the code. We also need to recognize when it's not going well and know how to remediate. So add to the chat, what do you need, just a little self-reflection, what do you need in order to feel more knowledgeable teaching and remediating reading? So we're back to the quadrant model. And when I first saw this, it was kind of a light bulb moment. I think I'm a visual person. And this really helped me kind of see where kids can lie on a spectrum of reading ability. So typical readers have high decoding, high language comprehension. Dyslexic students have low decoding. They struggle with decoding and encoding. They struggle with reading and spelling, but they have really high language comprehension. These are the kids that can tell you amazing stories and they know a lot and they are highly intelligent and they have a great vocabulary and you would never suspect a problem until they pick up their pencil or pick up a book to read and then it kind of falls apart. And then the opposite end of that spectrum is hyperlexia. And those are the kids that can read accurately and fluently and you would never think that there was a problem until you ask them to tell you about what they read or you ask them for some kind of internalization or output. And then you're like, but you read so well, right? So those kids I think are missed oftentimes until they get to intermediate grades because primary teachers are like, they're green. They're green in, on this assessment. They're looking great. There's not a lot of higher level comprehension that needs to take place when you're reading very um, lower level reading, right? And so then we get to third or fourth grade and we're like, Houston, we have a problem. And you go to talk to the first grade teacher and they're like, no, that kid was a great reader. So we need to really be able to recognize that early on and know how to remediate it. And then we have kids that have both low decoding and low language comprehension. And these are the kids that are going to need a lot of support. So how many of us are feeling like this right now? This was um, basically me in second grade. The beautiful thing is that we have the research. We know how reading works in the brain and we know how to help readers. We know what to do for a dyslexic kid. And so I think Maya, Maya Angelou said it best, um, do your best until you can. And then when you know better, do better. And we're in an era where there is a lot of information out there and we can all know better and, and do better. The next one is learning for all classroom. So if we build a classroom culture that seamlessly adapts and accommodates all kinds of learners rather than just one kind of learner, then we are going to have much more success and kids are going to feel a lot better in our classes. So this is dyslexia friendly classroom. If a child is dyslexic, they need intense instruction in structured literacy. They need multi-sensory, they need sound and word level, they need lots and lots of practice, bottom-up approach. And the good news is that also benefits all kids, right? So it is crucial for some, but it's not hurting anyone in your class by teaching them syllabication. It's not hurting anyone in your class by helping them crack the code. And if you look at just the list of accommodations, those accommodations that are going to be life-changing for your dyslexic kids are also not harming anyone. So a couple really quick examples. I already had showed you that as I was writing vocabulary on the board, rather than just writing the word coward and hoping everybody can copy it correctly or already knows how to spell it, I actually do a little modeling right then, and it takes 10 seconds. It would look like this. Now, the vocabulary word is coward. How many syllables does coward have? Cow word. Okay, cow word. What are the sounds in the first syllable? Cow, k, ow, oh, there's that pattern. O-W spells O like, L like cow. Er, O, E-R at the end of the word spells er. It happened in the past, so I write suffix E-D. Scoundrel. How many syllables? Scoundrel. And you can tell 
that this only, I mean, as I'm writing, I'm talking. So it's really a matter of seconds. And just that alone would be incredibly helpful for the dyslexic kid that needs to hear about that pattern and hear about that sound symbol correspondence 7,000 times. So maybe that is just one of the 7,000, but that child is going to learn that pattern a lot because it's just inundated. There's, it's frequent. They see it and hear it all the time. Same is true for language building friendly classroom. And this could be kids that are English language learners would hugely benefit from this or kids that come from language deprived backgrounds that just haven't been talked to a lot with vocabulary in an academic way or kids that have a language deficit. So all of these accommodations, they need their intense instruction in vocabulary and building background knowledge and syntax and visualization. None of those things harm other students, right? So if we just can get to where in our classrooms we're teaching in this way, we're teaching for all learners, it's just seamless, it's not even obvious to anyone that I'm accommodating someone, then all students will benefit. And an example of this is, um, these are our Google Classroom slides and the pictures are not there at first. So the student would just decode the word ditch but instead of then just moving on to the next word to decode, then I click a button and the two pictures of you can have a ditch like a depression in the earth, or you can ditch a plan and come up with a new idea. And right then I take an extra couple seconds to have a visual picture. So now people have visualization of what it is. They can, if they've never seen a ditch or don't have experience with that, they see it. And also I'm taking a minute to explain the nuances of our language, that those that word has two different meanings. There is a chapter in um, Brown Girl Dreaming that we just read this, this fall that is all about them visiting the candy lady. And they go into this candy shop and the setting of the book is in the 1950s, I believe. They go into this lady's house that she has candy shop in her parlor and they start describing all these candies, but they're candies that were, you that were popular back in that those days that most kids wouldn't know, like juju beans and um, moon pies and ne necos, right? And so as we're reading that chapter, in order to help my kids visualize this and understand that chapter, I just have this slide in the background. And I don't even really talk about it for very long at all. But there's a, a brilliant scene that's just great visual, visualization about lemon dripping lemon um, cello yellow ice cream. And so just to help those kids that don't naturally make those pictures and have that language, huge. And it doesn't take me very much time at all. And I throw that slide together and the next year it's already made. The last is the 80-20 rule. I feel like in education, we tend to swing the pendulum a lot, right? So for years, we were doing only small group, and that kind of dominated our reading block. We had lots of small groups and lots of centers. And then we've gotten some conversations going that that might not be best, and then we need more whole group instruction. But I think now we're like, but you can never do small group. And we need to stop the stop the pendulum and be like, let's, let's just do what makes sense. If 80% of our students need content, teach it whole group. Don't waste time teaching individual groups the same thing. If 20% of your students need the content or need it retaught or need more additional practice or need an extension, then teach it small group. And if you just kind of follow this rule, it's not like your, your, it, your day might look the same every day. It might be like it's a fluid process of going in and out of whole group and small group instruction. The other evidence-based teaching practice that I love that I think is life-changing is the feedback loop. Um, the feedback loop will save teachers time, give students immediate feedback, and the opportunity to learn from mistakes in the moment. So here's how it works. A student does some kind of output. It can be writing one word on a whiteboard. It can be a sentence. It can be a paragraph. The teacher comes by and says, I'm going to give you feedback on just one thing, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to give the student feedback on the two misspellings, the capital, the end mark, and the missing predicate. That's overwhelming and defeating. Instead, I'm going to say, wow, I love your sentence. It's off to a great start, but I 
Notice you're missing the predicate, so I don't know what your character says or does. Go ahead and add a predicate and I'll swing back by. And then I keep going to all students and I get back and I say, oh my goodness, now I get it. Now I know what your, what your character is saying or doing. And by the way, your character, great adjectives describing them. I could visualize that character perfectly by the adjectives that you chose. And what this does is it increases student performance. It increases learning. It reduces overwhelm of just getting um, tons and tons of SPs and red marks and circles and lines and on your paper, right? And if I spend time doing all of that and then I put that assignment in a Friday folder and the kid never sees it or looks at it and is like, whoa, too much, I would, I would never revisit that. It gives that immediate learning and it builds student and teacher trust and relationship. Um, I originally planned to model how all of this looks with a real fourth grade um, novel that we did this year about building background knowledge and connecting it to um, our phonics and morphology and syntax and building vocabulary and what I did whole group and small group. And I obviously ran out of time. So I'm planning on doing this lesson in the next few weeks and posting it on my YouTube channel so you can kind of see how I plan out that whole process. Okay, add your questions in the chat. How do you about uh, meeting the needs of diverse learners? And we're going to go to our final question. How do I respectfully remediate big kids? Um, I wrote an entire blog series about how to teach phonics to older students. The QR code is right there. So go ahead and take a quick um, chat, snap at that. And then... Um, you can go back and kind of do a deep dive into all of this. But the most important thing is to start with diagnostic assessments, right? You need to make sure that you know exactly where students are and what their data says and how the data can drive your instruction. And so we want to make sure we do that. And then we want to inspire students with that data. We're also going to do everything on purpose and build connection and celebration. I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly because I do notice that we're running low on time. There's also a, a blog on increasing student motivation in literacy that you can check out that goes into some of these. So when I first started intervention, I didn't want the kids to feel bad. I didn't want them to know how low or how bad it was. I didn't want them to see the red. And so I kept the data and was just doing all this magic, but never really told them about their growth or their, where they were. And then I switched my mindset and I was like, maybe if I tell them exactly what where they are and where they need to get and what we need to do in between and I let them in on that it will increase their motivation right I know that your strength as a reader is you have so much background knowledge and language comprehension now we just need you to get accurate so that you can actually lift the words off the page and read the words and I know how to do that so come with me let's track progress let's graph it let's celebrate let's do that I let kids in on tracking it. We've in this um, increasing motivation, we have several really fun, engaging ways to um, explain what problems are and then also graph our progress and in a kid in a kid friendly way. So check that one out. My next one is everything on purpose. So if a kid is struggling in literacy in beyond third grade, we're we're in trouble, right? We need to remediate that as quickly as possible for dozens of reasons. Most probably most important is their confidence and happiness and well-being. And so I promised them at the beginning of the year that we are going to do everything it takes to help them be successful readers. And sometimes when you're on a swing, you have to swing back a little bit to get momentum to launch forward, right? And so I use this analogy or metaphor a lot. And I say, some of the things we might do might seem like we're, we're swinging back a bit, right? You did this in second grade, I know. But this filling those gaps, filling those foundational skills is going to help us launch you forward all the quicker. And so I um, tell them, I promise them everything we do is for a purpose. We will never do anything just for fun or for fluff or, um, I mean, we, we do have fun, but we will never do anything that isn't purposeful in, in here. So I accidentally created a program and it really was by accident because when I was starting third through fifth grade intervention, I was struggling to find resources that I didn't feel that I felt like weren't too primary, that you can't take a fifth grader and put a 
primary worksheet that has the little kid clip art and babe, it feels babyish. It's embarrassing, right? And so I just started creating my own, um, my own things to make sure that I was, I was respectful of their maturity and, and their feelings. And then the next year I added um, stories to that. And then the next year I added the reading notebook and, and it just kind of all came together. And I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. And maybe if it helped me so much, it could also help other intermediate teachers. So this is um, the QR code if you want to check out that program. And then finally, I think the most important one is connection and celebration. So um, this one just is so, so important. All of these pictures are third through fifth graders in pullout literacy intervention. So I know that going, walking down a hall to a reading teacher for, for intervention cannot feel great. And my mission when I became an interventionist was, I want to make this so amazing. And I want these kids to love coming to me and love what we're doing so much that when they graduate out and they no longer need me, we both feel sad. And I've succeeded in that where kids will, I'll be like, fly little bird, you got it. Like you're on grade level. You don't need me anymore. Go fly, be free. And they're like, but can I still come? And if you can get a fifth grader to still want to come to intervention, you've won and it, it's possible. So I'm not going to tell you all of the, all of the examples, but the car, the picture in the middle with the car is a group of fifth graders. And they were really struggling with um, irregular words, with spelling irregular words. So I challenged them to learn 50 irregular words. So they took a pretest, they got the 50 that they needed. And we worked on 50 irregular words in one quarter. And I told them, this is big. This is, this is a big ask. But if you can do it, we'll have some kind of amazing red word party. And they were like, what is it? And I'm like, I don't know. You can help me decide. And we had this obnoxious little handheld timer in our classroom that would just beep randomly at the most inopportune times. And I would always make a big deal like that timer has got to go. And one of my students one day was like, you know what we should do for our red word party? We should destroy that timer. And indeed, all of the kids in that group learned all 50 words. And we went out to the parking lot and we ran over the stopwatch and then we hit it with on the sidewalk and shattered it into pieces. And they all took a piece of the timer home as a reward for learning 50 irregular words. So there's tons and tons of ideas of how you can bring intervention to life, how you can make it fun and engaging and exciting and, and kids will, will love it. Okay. We have 15 minutes left. So, oh, no, we don't. We have 11 minutes left. So add your questions about respectful, um, how to respectfully remediate big kids in the chat. And I'm going to have Kelly and Joe, our cohort co-host, unmute and tell me some of the themes that showed up in the questions. Kelly, are you there? Maybe, maybe we have some. Okay, let me see. I I can access the chat, so maybe we have a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, Kelly was compiling them. She must be having technical issues unmuting. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and give me a couple of the questions, or I can actually scroll? Um, I can scroll through them too. I'm going to go back up to the top, and maybe we can just pick a couple from each each section. Okay. Let's do this. I'm sorry for the delay. All right. Um, one question is, where do we find out more about um, your various routines? Um, I That's a great question because routines make everything, really. Um, I definitely have the um, Google Slides up for free available at my on my website. It's called the Favorite Online Link List. And the, um, the Google Slides will really help you establish kind of a routine in encoding and, and decoding spelling patterns. 
Um, as far as the other routines for the other five components, I don't really have that teased out, but that's a great idea for maybe some future videos or, um, or webinars. Um, let's see. I would like to talk about um, when we don't have two hours of literacy, but one great question. Time is always of the essence. And I would say, honestly, that would be integrating would be even more important, right? If you really only have one hour of literacy block and you know you have to get through all of the literacy content, then it's even more important to integrate that those ideas into history and science and bring them bring them throughout your day if you only have a day to really do to really do it. And even integrating like your patterns of phonics and morphology and your content rather than teaching them as distinct separate ideas. Um, what are good resources and online resources where we can find content reading passages? Um, also a great question. I um, built my own as we went. So if we read Treasure Island, I would create fluency passages about Treasure Island. So what the author was about and how a why a pirate wore a patch and building that background knowledge. And it seems very daunting, but if you have a team and you could all break that up and write a passage, then you have it every year. So I would just do some every year and then every year I'd reuse it and it builds pretty quickly. Um, I don't really know much about this, but I think honestly, the whole AI thing might be helpful in the future of like, you just need a passage about pirates or you need a passage about the civil war. Um, I have heard of ReadWorks and it's great for um, having passages for, for content related things. So if I'm teaching under, underground Rail, railroad, ReadWorks would be a great place to start. Um, okay, please share the schedule again about how to cover all the areas. This will be videotaped so you could go back and um, actually have freeze that slide if you'd like, or I can think of another way to maybe post it on my Facebook page as well. Um, I love the comments. Some of us got to our 50th year before cracking the code. I tell kids all the time, most grownups don't know this. You are probably smarter than the most of the people that you see in the grocery store. And just go home and tell your parents about the OIOY um, diphthong and see how they do. Letters training has been super helpful. Agree, agree, agree. I did it. Um, what screeners will help you identify where students are struggling? Awesome question. In that diagnostic, in that um, the blog about um, how to teach big kids phonics, the first one is the di how to di do diagnostic assessments. And I've described and linked some really good ones that are all free and you could start there. And then how do you use that data to determine where to start? Then I say, this group of kids can read and decode accurately, but need language support. This group of kids needs accuracy and phonics. And I'm gonna drill down and find out what the area of need on my sequence is and start there and build groups around that. They're skill-based groups. Um, let's see, core knowledge has great free text. Agree, agree. Um, where do you choose where to start with tier one instruction with diverse needs? Awesome question. Um, I would say, you would use the 80-20 rule. So if 80% of your kids already know our controlled vowels, do not spend time teaching our controlled vowels to your whole group. Take those kids that you're around your table and teach them then. But if 80% of your kids don't know our controlled vowels, do that. So really the 80-20 rule is, is awesome. Hey, Bree, this yes. is Kelly. <laughs> oh, good. I hey. made it. I made Here it. You You've done a beautiful job. Um, there is a specific question about where do you choose to start with tier one instruction when you have diverse needs? Awesome. I think I just was touching on that. Um, okay. and I would, I would say the 80, 20 rule is a really, really great rule to keep in mind. So in, when you collect your data and you see where your kids are, 80% of the kids don't know something start at the lowest of that. So in your, in the sequence, start with the simplest skill that 80% of your kids don't know and start there. And then just to piggyback on that, and then how do you balance practicing that tier one instructional skill set as well as fill in the gaps and the missing pieces? So balancing both what is being yep. taught 
at tier one as well as interventional needs? Great question. Um, I keep going in our sequence. So I just go week by week in our sequence. However, knowing what kids are still struggling on certain patterns. And so I do tons of review every, every warm up day, we might do a um, blending board where we're, I'm specifically picking patterns that I know some of my kids don't need. And that, that practice and that review is super, super helpful. But I think some teachers get stuck in like, we're going to do magic E forever because they haven't gotten magic E yet. And the problem is then the gap grows. So you still do need to keep going in, in your standards, in your grade level content, right? You still need to teach all kids tier one and then cycle back with the review with your small group or even whole group review would be really great. But keep keep your pace with tier one grade level content. I'm not sure if you mentioned this earlier, but there's a lot of questions around syntax and grammar resources. Um, yes. So um, I don't have a full program developed out. I, I know of a few that I really like that I've that I've learned grammar myself as an adult teaching fifth grade. Um, Michael Thompson is one that has, um, I I just remember it's called the Grammar Voyage. I can't remember if that's the program or just the the specific book, but his is very, very systematic. I also, um, I I did a deep dive into syntax and have just a, a launch pad available that is on my website, a blog about syntax of just how, I, how to get started with kind of the big ideas of syntax. But I think grammar, um, I've taught at schools that do a really good job of grammar and I've taught at schools that don't prioritize it. And there is a huge difference. I think it makes a huge difference to reading and writing. And so as a profession, we should figure that out and get great resources out there again. Um, I know you talked a little bit about diagnostics and I've added a couple links and there has been some questions around the use of diagnostics and screeners. There's been, a, and then also the sequence to follow kind of those um, scope and sequence questions and also the diagnostic questions. So just make okay. sure that um, on, on the website in the free resource library, all of the scope and sequences are for, are free. So you can download um, the one that we did for third through fifth grade. You can adapt it to your own needs. Um, there is a morphology scope and sequence. There's also an irregular word scope and sequence. And really, if you can get that sequence going in your school, that would be would be so great. Um, check out that free resource library. So that was a great segue. I think we're almost out of time. So I'm going to segue us into just a couple resources for you. I don't know why sometimes my next slide button doesn't work, which is, let me see. Okay, here we go. Free resource library. Um, a good segue. So lots and lots of free resources. You can see some samples of the program um, there as well as some of the tracking um, student progress things. So go ahead and quickly scan that if you'd like. You can also feel free, um, jot down my, my email. I would be so happy to answer some other questions that you might have um, if I didn't get to them tonight. So free resource library is amazing. If you feel like you haven't cracked the code yet and you just need really, I mean, this was a one hour, like skimmed the surface at the most surface level. If you need a deep dive, we have an amazing three-day class um, every summer and it is in Northern Colorado. So if you're local to Colorado, you should definitely come. If you're not local to Colorado, you should plan a trip because our state is beautiful and a lot of fun. And you could spend three days learning about literacy and then um, spend a vacation here. And um, if you do that, register quickly because prices go up on May 1st. But I'm also expanding to where next year I will be more available to visit schools. So really, if you can get an entire school this district aligned in this rather than just a few teachers teaching it well, it that, that systemic change is 
life-changing. And it took us about three years as a school to really get everyone on board and everyone trained and everyone systematic. And it has just been powerful. And then finally, I told you that I would um, post this video on my Reading Rev members Facebook page and also on my YouTube channel. So if you want to get grab QR codes for that as well, you are more than welcome to. And here is uh, my work cited. And that very first one is the um, is the sequence of higher level text helping kids systematically um, m to dive into higher level text. And it was um, probably the best webinar I've watched in a really long time. So that is the information to find that. And I will stick around for just a few more minutes if anyone has any other questions or comments or feedback for me. And if not, um, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate you all being here and um, and just sharing in this mission and journey. And we are all just learning as we go. So I appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight. You're so very welcome. Thank you all. Can I go back a slide? Yes. Maybe. I don't know why. There. Video. Oh, it's on.